When Antonio Michael Downing was a little boy, his grandmother was his whole world. Growing up in Trinidad, it was his grandmother who introduced him to the power of poetry and song. He was 11 when she died, and overnight he went from the warmth of Trinidad to the bitter cold of a Canadian winter, sent to stay with an aunt in small northern Ontario. And so began Downing's journey of identity, one he has put into writing and now into a book, and he's here to share it with us today. Welcome to your morning. Hi, nice to meet you, Emery. Thanks for having me. Look Nice to meet you too. I cannot, uh, I cannot wait to meet the person behind these words. First of all, let's start with your grandmother. Tell me who she was. She's the first person we meet in your book. Uh, tell me more about her and what she meant to you. Wow. Um, whew, the big questions first. Um, my grandma, I grew up in Trinidad, in southern Trinidad. So, you know, it's a rainforest. Uh, it's the bush. And my grandma was born, you know, in 1904. In a, in a colony, and you know, British colony, British empire. And mm -hmm. uh, she, you know, it was a tough life. I mean, you yourself were, uh, Anne-Marie were born, was born in a, in a British colony island. So I think you, you know, that's in your heritage as well. And so it, yeah. she had two things to get through that. She had songs, she would sing hymns, and she also had, mm -hmm. um, words. She loved to read the Bible, and she would read the very poetic parts of the Bible, like Psalms and Proverbs. And her eyes were bad, so she taught me how to read at a very early age so that I could be her eyes. And those two gifts that she gave me and this life of mm -hmm. faith and service to others was the first. It was how I learned to see the world, and so it had a huge impact to this day. I'm a singer and a writer, so words and songs. It is so sad then when we learn just before you become a teenager, you lost her. She died and you're sent to live with an aunt uh, in a small town in northern Ontario. You left the sun and the sunshine for the bitter cold of winter. Recall for us some of your first memories of being in Canada. What was that experience like? <laughs> wow. Um, I think, uh, well, there are silly things like icicles, for example, I had never seen ice outside of a freezer that didn't melt. So I remember like just staring, like just awestruck at icicles for hours. Um, the way people talked, um, the, 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 the color of people's skin, people had different color eyes. It was amazing to me. Um, I, I spent forever, cause I was musical, just learning how to talk like people like, oh, how you doing, buddy? What's going on, eh? You know, I was like, I'd practiced that forever because I wanted to get it right. And then, you know, my brother fell through the ice that first winter. So we learned uh, good and bad lessons that winter. Um, you know, you talk in your book about some of your experiences in high school. And, you know, when people cast their mind back to when they were in high school, and they may or may not have interacted with somebody who was non-white, an act uh, as simple as reaching out and touching your hair, which would seem casual to them and, and non-threatening, left a huge impact on you. And when you decided to, you know, do the same action back to them, there was mm -hmm. you were met with anger and frustration that you were messing up their hair. How did that impact who you started to be as a young man, a young black I'm man so in Canada? Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that in a, in itself is a microcosm of how I deal with being a black man in Canada. Basically, folks were touching my hair because it was weird and not normal, um, but they felt like they could just, you know, touch me. And so I just touched them and then they would be like, oh, you know, they would clutch their pearls. And suddenly it was like, they understood what the experience was like. And then we had an understanding and we could move forward in, in a better space. So I feel like that experience of, of bridging the gap and sort of turning the tables is, um, is very much how I approach, um, you know, making my way as a black man, as a Canadian black man. I mean, I love being Canadian and, and I love that we can have those dialogues about, hey, here's your experience, but you know, maybe that's not everything. Here's a different way. Antonio, Michael, we have such a short amount of time left, but it's so important that I get your answer to this. So you're going to have to be poetic, okay. but short. Um, you <laughs> write how your personas were the cure for self-loathing, and you wanted yeah. those disguises to digest and spit out somebody who was worthy. What did you mean by that? 
I mean that, whew, poetic but worthy. I mean that sometimes Oscar Wilde says, give him a mask and he'll show you the truth. So for me, mm. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, but when I could get on stage and I could sing and I could wear that mask, suddenly no one could tell me that that was a place I didn't belong. And, and I built my life around that art and that space. So yeah, that's poetic and short, right? It was. You know, your grandmother would be very <laughs> proud. Uh, the book is called Saga Boy. It is a definite must read for all uh, for all Canadians. I love the stories that you shared there. And by the way, my daughters and I loved your music in Tiny Pretty Things. Antonio Michael Dowling, oh. thanks for being on your morning. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Emery. Have a great day. <laughs> thanks for watching. If you like this, be sure to subscribe here. And you can check out more Your Morning videos right here.